let's stand together. Let's reflect on God's goodness this morning. His nearness to you right now. this morning. Amen. Amen. You guys doing okay this morning? 
It's good to be with you. My name is Jalisa. If we have not had a chance to meet, and I hope you guys are doing well this weekend. I know that we've got people who are in the room this morning, people who are sitting outside in the cold joining us online, and some of you who have chosen to stay cozy at home and watch the service online this morning. Wherever you are, we are glad that you're here. And I want us to take a second this morning, and I'm gonna ask you to trust me for a second, and wherever you are, whether you're in the room or you're at home, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes for just a minute. And I don't want us to miss the opportunity to reflect on God's faithfulness to us today. I don't want us to miss the opportunity to reflect on the fact that his goodness is coming after us. The Psalms say that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's think this morning about a way that you saw God show up faithful to you this week. Maybe it was in someone you saw, something you heard, something you ate. We're so very grateful this morning that we can stand here and sing that your goodness is coming after us. And in a year like this, there's so many things that don't seem good, but you are good and you never change. And you never fail and you never forget us. God, thank you for the moments that you've shown up for us, even just this week, even this morning, maybe God for the moments that you've spoken to us, the moments that you've cheered our hearts, the moments that you have reminded our souls of who we belong to. God, I thank you for the moments when you have lifted my eyes to see you above all else. There's a security there, a hope there. You are a refuge for us. Would you make us a people who don't forget? Let our hearts remember and reflect on the ways that you move and pursue and come close. for songs of loudest praise today. That's what he's worth. That's what he deserves for all the moments that he's pursued us, all the moments that he's reminded us that we're not alone. You're not alone today. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy praise Streams of mercy never see It calls for songs of loudest praise. So teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, the mount of thy Here I raise my heavenly 
hearts are sealed for you and you only. God, we pray and ask this morning that you would make us a people who remember your goodness and your faithfulness to us. God, that we would remember that we are a people who have much to be grateful for because we have a king who laid down his life and changed ours forever. Jesus, we love you incline our ears and hearts and minds today to listen and to know and love you more. We pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. My name is Ross, and it's a privilege and a joy to be with you this morning. My uh, thoughts are with all of those uh, in the church who are gathered around the city and around the world today. For those of you uh, still in your jammies watching the online service, um, we see you and we're grateful for you and kind of a little bit jealous. Uh, to those gathered in congregations, thanks for uh, being here this morning. And then to those sitting outside at our campus facilities um, on this pretty brisk uh, first winter's morning, it feels like. Uh, thank you for making that sacrifice and that effort. I pray that the Lord blesses your commitment together in his name today. I hope and pray that you had a good and peaceful and restful Thanksgiving and that you had an appropriately restrained and sanctified Black Friday um, and that you're living with low regrets um, after both of those events. Matthew 16, 24 is where we will be. And so if you have your Bible, why don't you turn there with me. But before we get into the text this morning, I wanted to briefly just draw your attention to a couple of things. So firstly, in this season um, where we remember the generosity of our God who came to get us and, and incarnated in the form of a human baby boy and came to rescue us, uh, we wanna celebrate um, giving and serving opportunities uh, in this season. And so every year in this season, we wanna offer opportunities to tangibly display 
our love for God, our love for church, our love for the city, and our love for the nations through Christmas service opportunities. And so this year, I'm excited to let you know that as a way for us to display our love for the city in which God has us, each congregation at the Austin Stone has partnered with a local nonprofit. And if you go online at austinstone.org forward slash Christmas, and you scroll through the congregations there, you will find opportunities for you to show some practical love for our city in a spirit of generosity. While you're on that site, austinstone.org forward slash Christmas, you'll also find all of our Advent resources. Advent season starts today, although our Advent sermon series only starts next Sunday. But if you wanna spend this time reflecting on the incarnation of Christ and the tremendous gift that he has blessed us with, then please jump on the website and check out all of those Advent resources. Secondly, in a season where we remember the generosity of God towards us, we wanna remind you to continue to partner in gospel generosity through giving at the Austin Stone. I'll just be honest for a second, as a pastor, I always feel icky talking about money, it feels self-serving. And so for many years in my ministry, I just wouldn't do it. I would just pretend that it wasn't a thing. But as I've walked this journey of discipling people and, and, and leading them um, to, together with myself to greater Christ-likeness in a discipleship journey, I have realized how God has used generosity to disciple and sanctify His beloved children. It's an area that, that He continually reminds us, hey, where, where, your, where, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be as well. And so it follows the direction of our generosity. And in a year where we've all taken sort of hits to, to our true north in many ways, I wanted to just recenter ourselves and just to remind you, hey, you're a steward. Everything you have, God has given you and he is calling you to ongoing faithfulness in the way that you steward the gifts that he has given you. One of the ways that you do that is by giving regularly and faithfully and joyfully into a local church community. And you can do that here at the Austin Stone in a variety of ways. You can go on the austinstone.org forward slash give um, or in the Austin Stone app um, or by mail by sending those to our offices. All right, Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, 24 is where we're gonna be today. Here's what it says. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone, would come after me. He doesn't say, hey, for rock star disciples, hey, just for you 12, anyone, anyone who wants to follow the king, if anyone would come after me, here's what they must do. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with these angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, if you're sitting there going like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. This is the text we get um, in Thanksgiving weekend at the end of 2020. Are you kidding me? We're all carrying a lot right now. Now you want us to carry a cross as well. I share some of your reservations and I've been in an ongoing dialogue um, with the Lord over the last couple of weeks about his divine providence that he would choose this text for his church today. And so I wanted to preface it by saying a couple of things. We need to have some lenses in so that we can rightly receive and obey this text today. Firstly, if we're gonna live this way, the way that Jesus calls us to live, uh, it will make no sense unless we establish what we believe about Jesus' kingship in the first place. The first 16 chapters of Matthew has been proclaiming this one message. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, he is God incarnate, he is the one sent, the fullness of God in human form. You have to get that down first in your heart, even afresh this morning, if you're gonna follow him rightly. 
We have to stop and remember his lordship if we're gonna follow him in the way that he requires us to follow him. We must believe that he really is king. And we must believe that he really is a trustworthy king. Otherwise, what he says here will make no sense. And so friends, in addition to believing in his sovereignty, in his lordship, in his messianic qualifications, we also need to trust his character and his heart. Because if you just take these verses out, you're gonna be like, oh, that feels like kind of a jerky thing to say to us at the end of 2020. When the instructions of Jesus look tough, we need to ensure that we view them through the nature and character and heart of Jesus. And what else does he say? Well, he says that he came into the world that we might have life and life to the full. And so when he's offering us life here through loss, he's not offering us a lesser version of life. He's not offering us a joyless plodding along. He's saying, no, no, this is what real life looks like. Trust me, I see it all. This is what real life looks like. He's calling us into something way better than our current plans for our own life. And so our current plans don't involve carrying a cross. And he's saying, no, no, I'm offering you something way better. Why? He tells us that to be yoked with him, Matthew 11, is an easier burden than carrying anything else in this life. That, that taking his yoke upon us is a better way to walk, an easier way to walk, a lighter way to walk than us carrying all of the yokes of our own making. And so he's calling us into something that is actually easier to do ultimately than we are trying to do ourselves. Friends, listen, he calls you today to carry a cross. But when we see the fullness of his life and his teachings, we must conclude that the cross that he asks us to carry is lighter than the load of self-justification and self-reliance that we would ordinarily carry in its place. And so friends, I'm with you. I've wrestled with this all week. Not just for you, but for me. Because when I look at this, I go like, oh, I'm not qualified to speak on this text. I've shuddered at the thought of teaching it all week. I don't live like this. But I'm praying that days like today will alter the trajectory of my life and my lifestyle and yours and your lifestyle. And so the idea today, friends, please hear me. Just breathe this in, okay? I know you've taken some beatings to see it. The idea today isn't to make any of us feel guilty or insufficient in our pursuit of Christ, the goal is to give all of us a bigger and better vision of what real life in Christ might look like. Is that okay? So with those lenses in, let me walk through this very famous text and break it down section by section and see what Jesus is actually calling us to. Verse 24, he says, if would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, here is the reminder that the offer of life from Jesus is an offer of discipleship. It's an offer to walk in his way. And it's an offer that is simultaneously really wide and really narrow. Do you see the language? It says, if anyone would come, right? This is for anybody. Anyone can come and follow the king. And if anyone would do it though, there's a really narrow way to do it. <laughs> Anyone's welcome, but the path is narrow. And that path is through self-denial, cross-carrying, and Jesus following, it's a narrow path. You see, friends, the walk of discipleship and our relationship to Jesus isn't just transactional, it is also directional. It isn't just a status that we receive, it is that at the very least, which is amazing, but it's also a life pursuit that we're called into, a pursuit to walk in the feet, uh, walk behind the, the, the footsteps of Jesus Christ and to be like him. Remember the text from last week? I hope you do. Peter got out ahead of Jesus. And what did Jesus call him? Satan, right? No, no, Satan wants to lead out there. Jesus' followers, follow, follow. They walk behind him. They imitate him. They watch his steps and they go where he goes. This is what it was always supposed to be. And now Jesus goes on to explain what that life actually looks like. He says, you wanna follow? You wanna be my disciple? Here's three things. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And you can picture the disciples going, okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, 
is there another way, right? Because that way sounds, woo, that's a lot, right? Self-denial, cross-carrying, yikes, uh, following for lifelong, that, that sounds like a lot. Is there another way? Well, Jesus says, sure, let me juxtapose these options with a life that doesn't do any of them and the natural consequences that that leads to. Look what he says in verse 25. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now the word here for life is fascinating, friends. It's an interesting one. He would have had a few different words he could choose from in the language. The word he chooses is fascinating. It's the word psyche that we have recorded in the Greek New Testament. It's about more than just physical life. It's about identity. It's about what makes us, well, us. Our sense of self, our sense of self-awareness, our sense of self-esteem, our sense of self-value. Jesus says, hey, if you try to keep that and save that, you'll lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, then you have an opportunity to actually find it. Jesus is warning us in the strongest possible terms that if we establish and measure dignity, value, worth, and purpose in all the same ways that the world does that, then we will actually gain nothing. We will lose the very things we're trying to grab hold of. But if we are prepared to get our psyche, our life, our sense of self from something other than us, then we actually have a chance at gaining something incredible. You see, friends, every culture and every context has a way to measure worth, a way in which we measure this psyche. How are you doing? Do you matter? How, how do you know that you matter? A way for people to say, if you have that, then you have value. In some cultures, it might be in communal relational standing. It's in family ties. It's in uh, connections. It's in marriage. It's in procreation. It's in lineage. It's in a sense of belonging, right? That's a high value in some cultures. In others, it may be in money or in prestige or in power or in followers or in accomplishment or in success or in perhaps the strangest one, attractiveness. It had nothing to do with you in the first place. And yet if you have it, you matter. And if you don't, you do not, right? And so culture's telling us all of these things all the time. And so we're grasping at straws out there in culture trying to figure out, do I matter? Does my life matter? Uh, does it have any worth and value and purpose? Friends, I give in to these measures of comparative worth all the time. And it's made so much of my life unnecessarily miserable. I have a terrible habit of measuring myself against the outward signs of success and worth of others. Do you guys do this? You know that it ruins and erodes true intimacy and friendship? Because if you're always competing against someone else, how can you genuinely be their brother or sister or close to them? If you want what they have all of the time, then you cannot freely love them or yourself. And you end up in this miserable state. It's a joyless pursuit. And here's some of the good news of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I've come to offer you the end of that pursuit. But it means you've got to carry something else. You can't carry that. You've got to carry something else. You've got to carry what I did on your behalf. This wasn't in my notes, but I felt just as I was sitting backstage this morning, just a sense to, to, to share this. I was speaking with a counselor friend a couple of weeks ago, because we all need some counselors in 2020, right? We need some counselors and some friends. We need Jesus and therapy, um, it turns out, right? It's, it's been a bit of a thing. And, and I was saying to him, I just don't feel like myself. Right? And that's a dangerous thing to say to someone with a psychology degree um, because he turned around and he said like, well, who is yourself? I was like, oh, fool, I knew you were gonna do this, right? This is, this is a trick. I also did psychology at university. And he said, no, 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 seriously. If you were today, just give me one word for your own sense of self, what would it be? Take your time. And I thought about one word for my sense of self, my psyche right now. And the word I came up with, not proud of it, the word I came up with was disappointment. When I think of myself, when I measure in accordance with the successes of the world, when I look around at how other people are doing or seem to be doing at the very least, what do I think of myself right now at the end of November 2020? Kind of disappointed, right? This was supposed to be the year where I was gonna write some books. Uh, no, 
I haven't even read some books, right? Uh, this was supposed to be the year that I was gonna get in shape. It's tragically obvious how that has not played out, right? I mean, Humpty Dumpty has a shape and I'm imitating his, but, but that's not the shape that I had in mind. This was supposed to be the year when I got work-life balance. Oh my goodness gracious, it's hilarious. This was supposed to be the year Sue and I dialed up our sense of hospitality in our community. It's disappointing. But if that is gonna be where I get my dignity, value, worth, and purpose, then I'm gonna be filled with self-loathing and I'm gonna be grabbing hold of things that I desperately think will give me life, and Jesus says, you will lose it. <laughs> you will lose the very thing you're trying to grab hold of. Oh, friends, Jesus is saying to us, he's offering us, he's saying, whoever is willing to put down those measurements for his sake, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel, can get real life, real fulfillment, real joy. He's essentially telling us, you have to be born again. And then you have to live like you have been born again. You have to live differently than you did before. And we have to view our lives and our sense of psyche totally differently from what we did before in light of a king whose identity was marred and crucified so that you can finally live in the freedom of your true sense of self. Someone who is beloved by that crucified king carried that cross. But listen, it requires a loss. You have to lose your life for Jesus' sake to truly find it. How? Well, back to those three ways. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Those are essentially three losses, and that will form the, the, the bulk of the message today. What are these three losses, losses? Let's look at the first. The first is that you have to deny yourself. This means that following Jesus into the real life, the real psyche that he offers requires losing our sense of self-governance. One of the losses that we will have is self-governance, self-determination in a way. You see friends, the call, listen, of Christian discipleship is a call to deny yourself. <laughs> and we miss it, don't we? So much of what we see in the modern Christian message is that this life is ultimately about us and the fulfillment of our unrestrained desires. And Jesus goes, no, no, discipleship 101, deny yourself. <laughs> There's gonna be certain things within yourself that you need to say no to if you're gonna follow me. I love how Dr. Tony Evans described this verse when he says, <laughs> I love this, in a, in a formal commentary, I love this language. He says, that's a zinger to get your attention because denying yourself isn't fun. People don't typically wake in the morning and say, I can't wait to deny myself today, right? Thanksgiving weekend, we haven't even denied ourselves pie for breakfast, right? We just, it doesn't enter our minds. But he continues, in order to experience the lordship and provision of Christ on earth, you must be willing to say no to yourself. Friends, self-denial is an essential Christian discipline, one that I am no good at. Now, before you get too sad, this cannot be and isn't a call towards legalistic asceticism, where we just deny all pleasures uh, and we avoid all of the things that look like fun in a judgmental, joyless life, just saying no to everything. The Bible itself warns us in one of my favorite chapters, Colossians 2, that that doesn't work in our pursuit of righteousness. This is Colossians 2 tells us that looks like wisdom, just go be a monk, right? Just go withdraw from all temptation and go live a life of, of, of an ascetic. That looks like wisdom, but it doesn't actually deal with the problem. Why? Because sin is inside you. It's not an external thing. This self-denial is a turning away from all of the things we are tempted to believe will give us a sense of worth, of satisfaction, of joy apart from Jesus. It's a turning from building our psyche on anything other than Christ. And it requires, listen, a turning, it does, because it's not how we're trained to think in our flesh, a denying. This is so countercultural. If you wanna live counterculturally today, this is one of the ways to do it. Because culture says you are the collective sum total of your desires. What you want is who you are. And joy is found in you pursuing flat out without restraint what you want. Christ says, no, no, you're more than what you want. In fact, you will need to deny some of the things that you want if you want to establish who you really are. Identity is established at least in part in denial and not just in unrestrained affirmation of every part of you. All right, 
Let's just get the Spirit to do some work here for a second because we need the Spirit. If Christian discipleship requires self-denial, if this is the mark of someone following Jesus, where are you currently denying yourself in order to follow Him? Ask Spirit, where should I be denying myself? Where am I currently just following, grabbing hold of, and, and, and it means losing part of the life that you've actually called me towards? Spirit, just teach us. Ought you to be denying yourself a particular sinful pleasure in pursuit of your king who is absolutely holy. Spirit, show us. Where are we toying with sin? We, we, we've, we've lost, we've lost our holy reverence and all. We've lost our sense of denying our flesh. Where ought you to be denying yourself some sense of rightful power over others? In your pursuit of your king who came to serve. Where are you feeling a bit puffed up, self-righteous? You've got to deny yourself that and go serve those who you're trying to lord over. Where do you need to deny yourself some of the outrage that you currently feel justified in holding on to? <laughs> in pursuit of a king who turns the other cheek and who selflessly loves his neighbor and his enemy. Friends, I'm worried. Some Christians are adopting their primary identity in this cultural moment as outraged. And they see that as holy all of the time. Perhaps that might be the very thing that Christ is asking us to deny ourselves, saying, no, no, that's a guilty pleasure that's making you sinful. Deny yourself that and follow me in a more compassionate way. Our spirit teach us. Where is God asking you to deny yourself in pursuit of your true self? Secondly, there's a second loss. Let's take up your cross. And what this means is that following Jesus into real life requires losing our sense of self-justification. So not just self-governance, but also self-justification. All the things that make us feel like we are okay. So much of our life energy is spent trying to justify ourselves, trying to look awesome so that people don't think we are failing in our suffering, trying to look holier than we are so that people don't know how deeply we struggle in our sin, trying to look strong and independent so that people don't know we are actually really weak and terribly needy. It is a projection of a sense of self to the world and Jesus invites us into another one altogether. He says, hey friends, you wanna project something to the world? Project the cross. Those who follow me will carry a cross. And a cross, make no mistake, is the most shameful icon in, in, in the culture that Jesus was speaking into. And he says, that's what you need to project. Why? It represented weakness. And following Jesus is an acknowledgement of weakness and dependence. It represented guilt. And turning to Jesus as a savior only works if we acknowledge our own rebellion and our desperate need for his righteousness because we are sinners. It represented mockery and shame and followers of Jesus throughout the ages have endured that and will continue to do so. It is the ordinary way of the kingdom if we do it correctly. Friends, following Jesus doesn't work when we are desperate to portray our own justification to the world. We don't carry a cross to show that we justify ourselves we carry one as the constant reminder of Christ's justification for sinners like us. We don't carry a cross as a sign of our strength. Look at me, just bearing my burdens. No, we carry it as a sign of our admitted weakness. I have no chance outside of the cross of Christ. Taking up your cross is less about your own sacrifice than it is about being recipients of Christ's sacrifice, which means part of what we need to lay down in order to carry it is our own pride and our own self-righteousness. <laughs> we do the opposite of what this verse teaches us to do. I don't know if you've noticed this. This has become normal phrase, uh, normal um, nomenclature accepted in the language. Oh, that's my cross to bear. Oh, that's my cross to bear. That's my cross to bear. And, and we do it as a sense of pride. Look how strong I am. When the whole thing is there's supposed to be a sense of weakness. No, look how strong Christ is. And so I just limp along with his cross, which is easy to carry because he did the justification. Now to be fair, the cross does mean we must suffer differently from the world by knowing that our suffering servant king took the sting and curse of death from us so that we can endure it in a different way. 
But Charles Spurgeon reminded us, and I, and I got this morning to an alarming realization that I had a full sermon without a Spurgeon quote, um, which means uh, church discipline at the Austin Stone. Um, and so uh, I had to see what the Spurge had to say about this text, and, and here's what he said. He said, you do have to bear a cross, but not the curse. Your, your Lord endured both cross and curse, but to you there is not so much as a drop of divine anger in all that you are suffering. Your Lord sends you a cross, but not a crush. Isn't that amazing? And, and Tim Keller reminds us that the cross is actually a sign of love and carrying our own is a reminder of God's love for us. Look at what he said. He said, once you see the son of God loving you like that by the cross, once you are moved by that viscerally and existentially, you begin to get to a strength and assurance, a sense of your own value and distinctiveness that is not based on what you're doing or whether somebody loves you, whether you've lost weight or how much money you've got. You're free. The old approach to identity is gone. Why? You're marked by the cross. And the cross says God loves you. Third one, so there's, you've got to, lose self-governance, you've got to lose self-justification. The third one is follow me, which means that following Jesus into real life requires losing our sense of self-direction. The Christian life is this journey, pursuit of following. A journey where, listen, this, this is Christianity 101, but we've lost it. Where the more closely we follow him, the more like him we become. This is success in the Christian life. We become more like Jesus, and yet we're willing to continually follow after leaders who claim his name and look nothing like him in all spheres of our society. It amazes me. This is the invitation of Jesus. This is the life of discipleship, of apprenticeship. Learn my ways, be like me, become more like Jesus Christ. We follow, and as we do, we learn to live how he lived and to love how he loved, and to love who he loved. Friends, again, I'm nearly out of time. Let's just ask the Spirit to do some work here. Just assess your life. Are you becoming more like Jesus? Are your pursuits and your passions and the things you give yourself to making you more Christ-like? If not, change direction. <laughs> The path to real life is the path that he lays out for us. And some of us have taken other paths, okay. That's what repentance is for, stop, turn around, come back. Can you imagine, can you imagine the simple but profound power of a church full of people who are more and more like Jesus? This is a great accountability question to ask people. You want gospel accountability, ask them, hey, do you see more of Christ in me or less and where? Man, that's a sobering thing to reflect upon. Are we following him? Are we walking in his footsteps? Okay, quickly. What's that alternative? Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? The alternative to living the way of loss, the way of the kingdom, this way of apparent loss, is to pursue a life that looks like gain, but to find that it may well find you everything except the life that you actually desire. <laughs> you may get everything you want except the thing you want, which is your sense of self, and psyche, belonging, and value. What a terrible thing it would be to live your whole life in pursuit of things only to find that they failed to give you the sense of self that you thought they offered in the first place. I've been kind of fascinated by the life of the old English poet and playwright, William Somerset Maugham. Um, he was in his generation the most famous English author. He was also known for his immense wealth and crazy lavish lifestyle. And his nephew Robin became a Christian and gave him a Bible and asked him to read the New Testament beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. And, and, and William Somerset Maugham as a, as a scholar and, and, and as an a, a self-pronounced agnostic, but someone who was interested, uh, read through the Gospel of Matthew and hated the verses that we're studying today. He called them a lot of bunk. How can you lose your soul in pursuit of the things of the world? The last few months of his life, as he got sicker and sicker, he ended up giving into death alone 
and people would hear, including his nephew Robin from the hallway outside his room, him crying out in torment, go away, I'm not ready, I'm not dead yet, you can't have it yet. Gained the whole world, forfeited his soul. Some of us giving in to that pursuit in different measure. Okay, as we close, is there encouragement today? A lot of this looks like pure loss. We're trying to believe Jesus that this loss will be gained, but is there encouragement in his words for us today? Yes, look as we close. What did Jesus say? The son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Two big things here, first one, following Jesus might look like losing now, but it brings certain reward later. It might look really in this life like loss, but it comes with an eternal reward. Jesus says there is an ultimate reality where Christ himself will repay each person according to what he has done. And we know from the rest of scripture, this isn't works righteousness. This cannot be about salvation. This is about reward after salvation has been attained for us by Christ, right? But there's reward for our loss. He will reward those who deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. Their loss will be revealed as massive gain. And the flip side of that, he will give those who sacrifice their very soul for the trinkets of this world, the results of the deal that they made. The fruits of that trade will be made very real on that day as well. But friends, think of the eternal reward that awaits us. We don't think about it enough. I know in previous generations, they said that Christians thought too much of heaven, right? Disconnected them from the world. I don't think we think about heaven enough. And so we're too connected to this life as the ultimate reality. Jesus often points to eternity as motivation to live differently in the here and now. As C.S. Lewis said, just completing the trifecta, right? We've got Spurgeon, we've got Keller, we've got Lewis. I think we've completed the loop um, of appropriate quotes and we've got Dr. Evans as a, as a bonus, my goodness, um, just trumping that all, right? C.S. Lewis said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. When was the last time you thought of the rewards of heaven? If you really do, if you let your heart believe it, and if you meditate on it, it makes the trinkets of this world look pretty nasty and cheap. It helps us to deny ourselves. What are you living for? Are you living for the life of this world? Are you living for a well done, good and faithful servant in the next? Lastly, this teaches us that following Jesus might look like weakness now, but it will give us a view, a glimpse of the true power of the kingdom. I don't have time today, there's so much debate around what Jesus meant when he said that some of those standing there wouldn't taste death until they saw the son of man coming in his kingdom. Some say it refers to the transfiguration which comes next, which we will deal with early next year. Some say it re refers to the resurrection of Christ or the ascension of Christ. Some say it was Pentecost when the spirit was poured out into the church. Some say that it was a reference to Christ's second coming and the ultimate um, fulfillment and, uh, uh, of his kingdom. I say, yes. I think it is all of those things. I think it probably refers to the season of the manifestation of Christ's power and glory that included the transfiguration, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, and the revealed glimpses of the Son of Man's full magnificent kingdom in the launch and growth of the church. And what's good news for us then is we still get to see that today. We still get to see the Son of Man working in the building and establishing of his kingdom here on earth while we wait for the fullness of it to be revealed in Christ's ultimate return, in the here and now, all around us, we get to see evidence of the rule and reign of the Son of Man and the advance of his kingdom. Have heart, take heart, have good courage, saints. As we look around, I know we see a lot of things going wrong. You know what we also see? People continue to get saved. It happens, it's unbelievable, it's a miracle. Here in the city of Austin, here in our families, here across the nations, um, through our goers and through the many others that, that God has sent out there, people continue to respond to the gospel. Miracle. The Holy Spirit continues to sanctify us. Isn't that amazing? You know what the amazing thing I get to see all the time is? People change. The old adage, people don't change unless they have the Holy Spirit. 
then they do. Not as quickly as we would like, but they do. It's miraculous. God continues to keep us in the faith. You're still a believer today, that's a miracle. <laughs> you got out of bed today and came to church together with the saints to worship a God that you have never seen, but who you believe to be true and right. That's miraculous, it's a manifestation of the kingdom. The church continues to advance across the world, how? How does the church keep going? I'm telling you something, it's not through good leadership. <laughs> it's not through good earthly leadership. It's through the grace of God. And it's the son of man manifesting his power in the here and now until we wait for him to return. Oh, my beloved friends, I'm done. Following Jesus is the best adventurous life that you could ever live. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. But that cost, that losing now, is the only way for us to get to real life. And it has sure and certain reward in the end. It brings with it participation in the manifestation of Christ's great kingdom. Ask the Holy Spirit, what is he asking you to lay down today? Where do you need to deny yourself? And then where is he asking you to pick up the cross today? That sense of self-justification to just lay that aside and to pick up the justification that Christ has given you. Oh, Holy Spirit, teach us, encourage us, give us faith and joy. So Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. I pray that your word will be effective today. I'm such a weak servant in being able to bring it and articulate it and explain it. I, I feel those vulnerabilities in a big way today, but I refuse to be identified and defined by them. Rather, Father, I wanna... I wanna get my sense of psyche, my sense of real life of who I am from your son, from your abundant love for me evidenced in the cross by the justification that he provides for me in that ultimate sacrifice. Please Lord, remind me and us today, all of us today, that if we are in Christ, if we are believers, we are deeply loved and that our real life is found in our identification with him who has done it all finished it all and is now seated at the right hand of the Father manifesting His kingdom on earth until we see Him again. I cannot wait for that day when we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, come into your rest. Until that day, help us to carry a cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.
living for his kingdom. I won't bow to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be fucked by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings strength, That's what we're asking for today. Listen, before you go this morning, we want to speak an encouragement over you. This is from Romans 8. It says, so then brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to live in the flesh according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children and if children also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. You guys can have a seat if you're here in this room with us.